Good afternoon. Uh, it's April 29th, 2019, and we've assembled five of the world's leaders on credit to discuss credit as a cycle, the global market outlook. And one of the things that I worked on myself personally many, many years ago was this concept of the six lessons of credit. And I just put this up as a backdrop with understanding. One, credit is what counts, not leverage. Obviously, you have the potential to increase equity rates of return by increasing the levels of leverage. Most loans to real estate are not investment grade. Uh, interest rates are volatile and unpredictable. Hopefully, this panel will let us know how to solve that sequence. Credit research is more important than ratings. As we all know, generally the ratings follow uh, changes in credit. Sovereign debt has historically been risky, but the one I really want to underline for the group are debt values underpin all capital markets. And if we looked at what occurred in the fourth quarter of 2018, when we saw debt yields increase substantially, particularly for non-investment grade debt, the subsequent drop in the stock market at that time. But in an environment where there are very few covenants or any financial institution, even the five on the stage here today, have little bargaining power in the public markets, I'd like to start with you, Elfrin, and talk about how is your firm adjusted to this issue uh, of creating your own platforms to deal with this issue. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, <clears throat> I would start by saying it's not a new issue. You know, I mean, for a long time, we would reflect that if you built your business around just going into easy access credit markets, l let's call them that, it's a difficult business, and you saw that even in the fourth quarter of last year, both in terms of what can happen in easy access credit markets later in the cycle, and then, by the way, what happens when the capital comes back in. So you've, you've had, over this cycle, really short periods of opportunity in easy access credit markets. And so we're always looking to do hard access, not because we like to do hard things, but because that's where the value has been in markets. And so I think when you open up the lens and say not just what's going on in things like the US high yield market or the European high yield market, and say what's going on in the credit market writ large, there's, there's always a lot going on. I mean, the credit markets broadly defined are the biggest uh, financial markets in the world. And so when we overly fixate on easy access and traded credit markets, to, you know, to me it's a little bit like saying I'm only going to eat at one restaurant. And so I turn up sometimes and I like the food, I turn up sometimes it's overpriced, I don't like what's on the menu. Well, the answer is to learn how to cook. And so when we think about building our platform, we've learned how to cook lots of different things, and that's both in terms of going to markets where things are cheap, and in terms of literally doing our own cooking and delivering things to the market ourselves. And, and you know, I'll give you a couple of ex examples of how that manifests for us at the moment. We've built one, a very big business in Asia, and so Asia, I will say to you, is a market where there's just regularly higher return for the same level of risk than what we see in more developed credit markets. So not just more return, but the same uh, levels of risk. Those things are both very important. Uh, and we've really built that platform. I described it last year when, when I was here as a labor of love. And so you can't just go to those markets quickly and say, now I want to do India or now I want to invest in Indonesia. You have to go there ahead of time, build infrastructure, build an office, so we now have five offices uh, in the Asian region. We have a new office uh, in Mumbai as of last year. We have joint ventures in those markets, so we struck a joint venture with a very large Indian uh, credit firm called Aditya Bila Capital last year to focus on distressed assets in that country. And if you look at the India opportunity, which is on this slide here, there's about $500 billion of stressed and distressed credit in India now. You already had a very big NPL problem in that country, 200 billion uh, US dollars of NPLs in the banking system. You got last year a very big sudden stop in the NBFC, in the shadow banking market, which is, again, about a $300 billion opportunity of stressed and distressed assets. And we think will lead to even more uh, opportunities in cyclical asset classes like real estate. 
So that's one example uh, of, of how we address it. Certainly, we think about that and how we've built our platform to do this around the world. Another key example is what we've done in the financial services space. And so more, what can we give to the market and where can we originate credit at interesting rates of return? Uh, there's a slide here, I think it's slide 26 or so, that shows the different consumer finance, the different consumer finance uh, markets that we operate in and the rates of return that you can earn by owning the infrastructure to lend to the consumer. And you look there at the risk-adjusted yields that you can earn by originating consumer loans. Uh, and if you flip to the previous slide, you'll see all around the world this cycle, we've built platforms that originate credit to the consumer. And so we're not just thinking what the market can give to us, we're thinking what we can give to the market and how we can do it well. Alvin, let me just ask uh, to follow up. Because you're headquartered in Singapore and the uh, part of the other team is headquartered here in the US, uh, does the world look differently when you have a call and you're all focused on this from your perspective as to where the team is located? Uh, I think the world looks differently because we have, and we have 14 offices around the world, and I would say we're deliberately not headquartered anywhere anymore, and so we have a big hub in Asia, we have a big hub in the United States, we have a big hub in Europe. And so the world looks different to us in the, in the sense of we have a very deep lens on relative value across secondary, primary, liquid and illiquid markets all around the world. And as co-CIO, one of my big jobs is to take that information and say where is risk-reward positive and where is it negative at different points in time and to move our capital around to those different markets. And so the world looks different, in, well, the world looks clearer, I guess, in that sense. And I think it's very important, uh, and certainly all the folks up here have, have built this type of platform where you can not just say what looks good in one market, but you can dispassionately compare that across markets and say where your capital should be. Josh, you have the luxury at Canyon of investing really in any type of security anywhere on that capital structure, whether it's preferred, mezzanine, debt, first lien, equity, et cetera. How do capital markets look to you today? Obviously, if we assume debt markets underpin all markets, uh, and I know one of the things that your firm has really benefited from uh, is the ability to buy very complicated uh, transactions, securities, uh, where people just don't even bother to analyze the relative value because of its comp how complicated and in the mortgage securities you had to build a complete infrastructure in order to analyze these securities. What does the world look like in credit from Canyon today and how are you positioning the firm? Um, first of all, our long positions are about 20 points lower than they were in general about a year ago today. So we're taking a very much more conservative stance in general. And part of that reflects the extreme bounce back that the markets have had since December. Uh, and I think I, I share uh, Ilfren's comment about, the, um, about how if you just take what the market gives you in the most simple situations, in today's market, that's not very interesting. That might have been quite interesting when the whole market was stressed or distressed. But right now, uh, there are so many institutions that need to earn a certain yield. Yields are zero in big parts of the, of the world, and therefore it's become uh, a real contest where everyone fights with everyone. Josh, let's take yield. the group to this chart you just put up. <clears throat> so this shows... What was going on at Canyon in December? I assume you felt like a kid in a candy store. This was a great opportunity, although the mark to markets were probably more extreme than the actual trading opportunities. But th this reflects what happens when you have structures like mutual funds that offer their investors liquidity every day. Any investor can take his money out of an, a mutual fund any day. And those mutual funds, in their, in their desperate search for yield, have bought relatively illiquid securities, including high-yield bank debt leverage loans and high-yield bonds. So when they all of a sudden have outflows, it becomes quite a contest. In this case, obviously what happened was um, uh, Powell decided that, that raising rates would be a good idea, and he communicated that in a way that was so un unambiguous that it scared the market terribly. He, he wasn't yet skilled in the art of obfuscating his message like um, 
prior Fed chairs. Uh, so he said autopilot, and it scared everybody. And all of a sudden, people realized that these mutual funds could go down instead of up, and there were a lot of, of outflows. And there was a tremendous uh, spike down in the market that you can see through the end of November and beginning of December. So what we did, and we bought a couple of billion dollars worth of paper in that time, which was, which was, which was quite aggressive and quite successful, and it set us up for a while, but now you can see we're right back above the peak that we were at. But we responded in several ways, and there were sort of a lot of different stops along the train for us. The first stop was to say, okay, what are we already shopping for that's gotten cheaper? And there were a lot of names that I think um, fell into that category, um, mostly stressed and distressed names, everything from Caesars to Al Jeco to to our dog, B-Way, other things, the bonds dropped 10, 12 points. The second thing that we did, um, and let me go back, to, I wanna come back to that, I wanna really more talk about the corporate securities first. The, the, the second thing was um, we, we made a list immediately of securities that we had no interest in whatsoever at the prices they were trading at prior to that spike down, but where mutual funds were forced to sell them. There were rumors in the market that Lord Abbott and others had redemptions. And when those things happen, and when investment banks aren't making markets, the mutual funds tend to sell what they can sell, not what they should sell. So there was a significant spike down in, in a number of very high quality credits, as much as 15 points in certain cases. So we, we had a shopping list of those names. The, the third stop, after the existing shopping, shopping list and then, and then some of these new names that wouldn't have hit, were, um, were things that banks had, where banks had bridge loans. And those were, were uh, places where banks don't want to be holding those over year end, but they simply couldn't bring a deal to market. The, the high yield market was totally shut down in December. Not a single high yield bond came to market. And that was the first time in a decade. Now, we have all these charts up here that have nothing to do with what I'm talking about. They actually have to do with, with a totally unrelated trade, which maybe would fit better rather than me um, filibustering at this point. Okay, good. Um, but but I, suffice it to say that that, that, that downdraft is exactly what we look for in the markets. And, and we hope those are times when people are selling not because of changes in the fundamentals relating to companies, but because there are forced sellers who are forced by their structure to sell securities because they have redemptions. And that's when, to us, is a chance to get a lot of bargains. So as you know, uh, Josh, there's this old adage, luck is when opportunity meets the prepared mind. So all you're telling us is that you get prepared for these swings and took advantage of them at that time uh, and, and identify them so if they do occur. Sir Michael, let's go to, you have the ability to see clearly things on a worldwide basis that most people don't see. That uh, idea, that obscure, the way of looking at the world differently. And it's so impressed me over the years where your conclusions. Take us today kind of around the world and how do you see the world today? Well, the, 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 the world is, um, is, is pushed by regulation. Uh, regulation has uh, changed a number of things uh, indeed, and I'll, and I'll also go back to the ge geopolitics before I do that, but, but let's be clear. We can all get the knowledge. Everybody can get the knowledge. The really challenging thing is how do you go from knowledge to insight? And that point is to go from knowledge to insight, yes, you need the hard work. As they say, the harder I work, the luckier I get. You need the hard work, you need the fundamental work but you also need to understand the context. And that context is the geopolitical work, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. But, and what does that give you? It's imagination. You, we all get here paid by, for imagination. And that's the point, going from knowledge to insight. But the reality is, let's look at some of the uh, regulatory issues which we've got at the moment. I mean, you can see what the, what the regulatory has done to the world that, uh, that, that we, we, we're trading in. The dealer inventory is much lower because, again, the, the the, the regulators have forced out the banks to hold it, and yet the, 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 uh, the market cap of, uh, of the holdings is higher. It's, it's also meant, where has all that gone to? There's a growth in passives, which I think is a part of that thing. Uh, I think we should stay on that last slide for just a second, Michael. And I, I think one of the things that has really struck me, when I think back even to 1986 of the inventories we carried, they might be larger than all the inventories today at today's dollars that people are carrying. And 
this enormous mismatch that you're showing us here of dealer inventories, let's just talk through for a moment how your firm, how CQS would take advantage of that. Well, again, it goes back to the fact we are now in a much more volatile world. Uh, it basically means we are stepping in to the place where the banks used to be. That's exactly where we are. We are stepping into where the, where the banks were. And the, the reality is there's much more volatility there. But the, and the, the other growth uh, we've got there is in the, in the passives, because again, uh, there, there's also a heck of a lot of passive trading out there. Uh, and the reality is that what, what, what it means is that we will be able to provide uh, opportunity, to, or just, or we'll be providing liquidity when, when, when others don't. And the helpful thing is, when I used to be a market maker, when I, when I traded at, at, at Salomon and Goldman and Credit Suisse, when I used to be a market maker, you know, we traded at much, at much narrower spreads. Now, we're trading in much, much more brutal spreads, again, for the seller, because we're buying it where we want to buy. We don't have a market making op op obligation, or, op or and we were able to take advantage of the opportunity. And the other thing that's happened, again, if we look at uh, slide 51, again, the regulator, the regulator has pushed the bank capital around. Now, the helpful thing in the US is that the, the US banks have dealt with that, but you see what, what's happening is the global regulation is driving an increase in bank capital. How are we taking advantage of that? If we, uh, if we look at uh, the slide, uh, you can see what's happening. The regulator is asking for more and more capital, and it goes, I won't go through all the technical terms, but it goes all the way from equity to, uh, to, to various structures. And in Europe, because Europe is behind the eight ball, uh, there's a uh, significant risk transfer uh, market out there, which is again nascent. And again, that, that is, uh, it, it's in the billions, it's not in the tens of billions, but that, that one is, uh, it, it's at slide 52. You'll see that there, there's some in interesting things happening. A tier one, Lloyd's trading around two, two, two and a half percent. And then you take all the bank risk. If you're looking at the Weatherby, which is the, what they're, what the issuing vehicle there is, that's around 10%. I mean, there, there's such ludicrous mismatches in the, in, in, in the world, thanks to the regulator. And the reality is, the asset allocation process is such that uh, it makes it um, uh, much more difficult for, for people to be nimble enough to go into those places. And you can see the, the uh, European sea uh, uh, risk transfer is a d diverse collateral uh, piece, which again, mainly in Europe, because again, the US, uh, as always, is ahead of the game. Uh, the banks are ahead of the game, but uh, they're, they're not ahead of the game in, in Europe, that, it, which uh, gives us an opportunity. It's a really interesting, I mean, Europe is the king of regulating things to death. Uh, if you pull up slide 16, I think your point on yeah. bank capital is really interesting, where you've seen such a huge increase in bank capital ratios, and yet the European bank capital market is still one where you can earn really interesting returns and do proper security selection. Uh, very much the case, yeah. yeah. So, David, you're sitting there in December of 2018, and you're not even bringing any issues for Sir Michael, Josh, Ilfren, mm -hmm. or Jim to buy. <coughs> What's happening? Why didn't you bring issues in that period of time, and how did your firm and how did you react to the the situation, and when Michael shows you the low level of inventories, I know you as a firm have really prided yourself in your ability to distribute your relationship with institutional investors uh, from that standpoint. Take us to the fourth quarter and the first quarter, these dramatic swings that occur as you take responsibility for the position at Credit Suisse. Sure, Mike. And um, you're right about the fourth quarter. The fourth quarter, the high-yield credit spreads uh, gapped out. Uh, it was the largest quarterly move since 2011 after the U.S. downgrade. So, um, and about half of that credit spread gap out occurred in the first two months, and the other half happened in December. Uh, but two-thirds of the market is leveraged loan issuance. Um, One-third is high-yield issuance. And Josh is 100% correct. It was the first time that there hasn't been a high-yield bond issued in a month in many, many years but we continue to bring leveraged loan product to the market. Um, the market would support secured debt at that time, and we just had to make sure that we priced it properly for the market conditions and the credit that we had, had on hand. So you see here, 
The size of leveraged finance markets up to $2.6 trillion. Um, you see the leveraged loan market has virtually doubled since 2011. The overall market size uh, has increased by 54%. Um, but our firm continued to underwrite deals. Um, we just had to make sure that we had the right credit spread put, applied to it and the right flex uh, on a go-forward basis. Um, if you pull up page 64, slide 64, um, you see, you just see the, that credit spread movement that we're talking about. And on the left side's loans, on the right side's high yield, that 225 basis point gap out is what we're talking about is the largest move ever. You see that about, two th about 80 percent of it has retraced since um, the beginning of the quarter. On the loan side, however, maybe two-thirds has retraced. And you see that the credit spread is still um, higher and significantly higher than in, in the prior six quarters. Um, so we still think that leveraged loans, by and large, are cheap uh, and a very good place to, uh, to invest capital. You're secured in the capital structure. Note that your, the credit spreads are actually, on average, higher than the high-yield credit spreads at 435 versus 409. So that's rather unusual. If you look at the credit dynamics of what's going on, if you go to 62, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about where leverage ratios are going and how does that look compared to pre-crisis. And so here's some interesting stats. Everyone's focused on leverage ratios. We're still about a half turn lighter than pre-crisis. We're a quarter turn lighter than um, in, in 2018. But what matters most is debt service coverage ratios. And you see that we're three turns debt service coverage over that three year period, 2.8 versus 2.1 if you compare 07 to 18. And look at the equity contributions. Um, you have 40% equity below the cap stack uh, compared to pre-crisis. It was on average 30. And then finally, you have default rates. They're at 1.9%, um, awfully low. Uh, iHeart's about to roll off that. When iHeart rolls off, we'll be down below 1%. So we view it as um, it is a very, um, a very decent market to, to acquire uh, secure debt in this environment. David, take us into the decision process as you are talking to issuers about issuing debt and the trade-off between issuing second lien, first lien debt versus selling bonds and having to have non-call periods for a period of time. Yep. How has that interaction between your firm and issuers changed? during these two periods, the, the fourth quarter and the first quarter, because I've noticed in this year there's a higher percentage of bond issuances than there were late last year and during last year. What has occurred? Yeah, what's, what has occurred is um, primarily in the private equity world, we're finding there's more and more uh, gravi people, uh, gravitating towards first lien, second lien loan structures versus bank bond structures. The larger corporate deals tend to be more bank bond, and we're also seeing a, um, a, quite a bit more secured bond issuance. So that's part of what you're seeing, Mike, in terms of what's been going on the first four months of this year, um, is secured bond issuance versus loan issuance. We've seen a, quite a bit of inflows into the high yield bond market that's helping to fuel that, that the, that's the technicals, whereas the leveraged loan market has seen some outflows, and that's very much driven by the fact that it's a floating rate product. Um, last year, when people thought interest rates were going up, people were jumping into a floating rate product. Now I think the, the consensus is we're not going to see interest rates going up anytime soon. Um, and so that's helped the, the, the fixed rate product. Jim, you're one of the largest investors in credit in the world. Um, the significant growth in your firm, Apollo, much of it in the last few years, even though you had the largest uh, private equity fund ever issued has been really in credit and the majority of the assets of the firm today are in credit. Uh, I know you have certain views on interest rates and markets. Uh, tell us how you view the markets, how you're building the credit capabilities of your firm. I feel like I'm back in grade school. Having Z, I get, get asked at the end of the class. So I, I, <laughs> it's been the quietest 25 minutes since I've been here at the conference. But, 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 I, but, I, but I would say, uh, you know, for, for Apollo, you know, we, we all on this panel run a variety of businesses. And whether it's building platforms or taking, taking advantage of dislocations, um, you know, I think that we are in a period right now. The, the question that you're all asking in the audience to yourself is, how long is this cycle going to keep going in credit? And does it still make sense to have credit in your portfolio? And the answer is a resounding yes. 
the reality is that where we are right now in the global cycle, and I'm not a macroeconomist, I know it violates one of Mike's six principles, but the reality is the, if you could push up slide uh, 72, I believe it is, um, right now, the last four or five years, I think when the Fed looks back and says, what mistake did we make with quantitative easing and modern monetary theory, they're going to say we really mistook the situation with regard to technical innovation and demographics. And I'll give you a great example. I was with the CEO of one of our companies we bought out of bankruptcy uh, six years ago this weekend. When we purchased it, we had 11,000 employees in 15 plants, 700 million in top line revenue and sales. Today, we don't own the company anymore. Two facilities, 1,100 employees and we have sales 25% higher. So there's a massive deflationary impact going on with productivity. That's going to keep rates lower for a lot longer. And the strategies that we're doing at Apollo with origination, building platforms, which has been a big part of our business, that's going to continue. The second is the demographics. And I think it's on uh, slide 74. Uh, the reality is we are all, we all started in the QCIP business involved in trading desks on the sell side. We've all morphed to the buy side. QCIPs can't handle enough of our needs, so we're out originating platforms, creating platforms like we have at Apollo, Midcap, our middle market lending platform, uh, Amerihome, our residential platform. Uh, others on the panel have done the others. The, uh, others. But the reality is, for the great credit investors today, QCIPs are not going to get to your, to your promised land. And you can see on the, on, the, on the demographics on the actual supply of, of corporate bonds and the need and the demographic need for savers around the globe, it's going to have a big impact. So um, I, I'm very, well, I see a lot of tenuous concerns. And I know there's problems, whether it's in the commercial, resi commercial uh, residential market. Uh, there's challenges in certain markets around the globe, the Chinese market with NPLs. You know, we, we certainly are a view that the, the market's going to continue in credit and we want to be long credit here. And you know, certainly there will be some dislocations, and you, ha you need to have vehicles that the market structure that Sir Michael and Josh talked about, you want to be able to capitalize on those. You do not want to be part of the crowd uh, in ETFs or mutual funds. You want to have structures and vehicles that can take advantage of those. But credit is certainly part of your long-term allocation. It's going to be a part of your allocation for quite some time to come. And how you navigate that with real alpha managers that are having origination, non-QCIP focused, that's going to be how you survive and do well. So Jimmy, you talked about two areas. Maybe just spend one more minute. When we talk about technology, um, I think we have to ask ourselves, um, the realization that every single day, the percentage of the world's economy that is digitized goes up. So if you look at the GDP, whether I'm downloading music, whether I'm downloading movies, whether I'm moving medical information digitally, that percentage goes up. And the cost of that continues to drop dramatically as you go to the entire world, Mark. And I think that's a point you're making here the second point on demographics, I might make a different point on that, uh, is that the, the supply of investors who are coming into the market from around the world, if you just looked at the world where many parts of the world, people are putting 100% of the money up to buy real estate or buy residential, as markets come to this, this will free up tens of trillions of dollars and incremental capital. Just in India, Elfrin, people whose net worth for generations was in colored stones or gold or silver, which they wore around their wrist uh, or their ankle, as they enter the financial service market. 80 to 90% of all movement, if you look at Kenya as potentially the future, is moved digitally now on smartphones or mobile phones today. Uh, as these financial assets come into the world, I think what you're pointing out here from a demographic standpoint is that there's a lot of things going to occur that could limit the upside movement of interest rates. Jim? Yeah, it, it, you and I have talked about it. In Japan, the, the, the search for yield, 
uh, in the pension system and their limitations on portfolio allocations, their requirements to have so much Japanese government debt, which those in the audience who are familiar, you know, yield 10 to 15 basis points, their desire for U.S. high-quality senior leverage loans, their, 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 their desire for strategies that can yield 6 to 8 percent in dollars, it's voracious. And that's not only in Japan, but in other parts of the, of the uh, growth in what's going on in the Middle East, obviously endowments and family offices. So we see just a tremendous demand for this type of safe yield uh, around the globe. And again, sometimes it's through market dislocations of the product that David produces, um, but, but many times it is with a portfolio that can do a, 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 a allocation of liquid and illiquid strategies because the concern that we've all raised up here of the amount of uh, ETFs and other types of strategies that on the surface look wonderful for transaction, limiting transaction fees, they're crowding into the same trades. And as they crowd into the same trades, there's a variety of asymmetric risks that they're providing to customers unknowingly. And it's our view that while people love to you know, rub liquidity all over themselves in terms of feeling safe, there's actually just a greater desire, greater concern for risk uh, in those assets than illiquid assets if, if you have the right credit manager putting it together. So I'd like to approach maybe something a little different here. The historic history of CLOs, securitized loans, securitized bonds, has been very positive over during very difficult economic times. Dramatic differences in the performance of mortgages or CMBS than that. We have in the United States, uh, in Congress today, expressed concern about the performance. So I'd really like to the default rates have been so low and the performance. But let's talk about the dramatic change that's occurred here. There is no financial investor in the world that we've discussed, which is what's driven four of you into creating your own platforms that really can demand covenants today. And so David might like you and tell you he wishes he could give you covenants, but his client is going to go to the person who's going to loan them the money without covenants. So without maintenance covenants. And so one of the questions, and first lane even, as we look at this, I'd like to start with yourself. And what is the future going to bring? You have a concern in Congress and other places. First, maybe a lack of knowledge of what the past was. But even if we look at this performance of the past, what is going to happen to default rates historically where you'll be able to hang on to a company substantially longer because you have no maintenance covenants? And so until you stop paying interest or until maturity occurs, the owner has the freedom to decide how to run the business. I'd like to pose that to the group. Let me start with Ilfren down here. Yeah, I mean, I think if you think from a market perspective, it depends on what type of cycle you have because... I guess unambiguously, a sponsor can hold on to the company longer at some level, but it just looks like high yield. So if you have a bad enough cycle, you'll still get a very uh, significant pickup in the, in the default rate. And so I think you, you need to look at it from our perspective as much as anything, you know, how can we create product that has better protection than that in the marketplace? And so to pick up on, on Jim's point, I mean, really, that's what we're trying to do in our origination business is say, well, let's not just accept that the market uh, is delivering no covenants. How can we originate paper that has covenants? And then, look, in the traded market as well, it exacerbates some of the, the dislocation that Josh was talking about because people will panic differentially depending on their view of where the cycle is in holding that paper. But I think the most important point is, is back to origination. If you pull up uh, slide 20 here, for example, I mean, a good example of of what we're doing uh, in our origination business is in the E&P sector, which has been a terrible sector for taking what the market gives you in terms of covenants or protections in credit, whereas there's a huge demand for capital in that space. It's one of the most capital-hungry spaces in the world. The high-yield market hasn't been open to it. 
the equity markets haven't been open to it. And so if you've built an origination platform and the ability to go and provide credit to a credit-hungry space at a time where it needs it, you can set your own terms. And so one approach to it is to build that engine. And if I think at a more macro level, what we're trying to do in having all these engines is to take some of the cyclicality out of our business and be able to say, the alpha in credit is not just in waiting for a cycle and things to get cheap. The alpha is also in the engine and our ability to deliver to you guys at scale, well, efficiently, sizable, uh, originated credit in, in lots of different markets. And a point that Jim didn't make is just how much traditional banks have retrenched from a lot of these spaces. I mean, there is no traditional banking finance to stress sectors. There is no banking system that's providing the capital required to grow in Asia. And so you're in hunting grounds where David isn't in, in a lot of cases. We love David too, but he's not willing to deliver to us these things. We go and originate them ourselves. So, Elfram, what you're saying is your, your strategy has been to protect yourself from whatever the volatility is by shifting your investment into platforms. Josh, you have taken advantage, particularly as I think back about CMS, of where in the structure to come in. So, uh, as we saw in that chart here, actually CLOs have outperformed, have had lower default rates than the underlying securities. So obviously you could come into the AAA tranche, the AA, the single, the triple B, or the non-investment grade. How are you looking at CLOs? And if uh, an owner has the potential to own a company through a cycle, going down and coming back up, how does that affect your decision as an investor? Uh, let, let me start by taking a little bit of a step back on structured products generally. Not all structured products are created equal by any means. CLOs, uh, rode through the worst recession we've seen in since 1930s. Uh, or largely, maybe since 74. L largely unscathed, <laughs> largely unscathed. Uh, I think the default rate CLO but historically... They didn't, they didn't exist in 74. That's, that's true. Um, and they might not have survived, or they might have, but at least they have a match between assets and liabilities. And some of the assets are pretty good, and whether the covenants are what protected people or not is, is debatable. Um, but I would argue that that's not the same uh, if we go back to one of your first points with respect to other structured products like CMBS and CMBX. And that's why I'd like to go back to those slides that we um, had on the screen that were not relevant to what I was saying before, <laughs> but they are now. So let me let us go to slide three. Um, a lot of uh, commercial mortgages um, are wrapped in CMBS. Uh, are basically mortgages uh, that are commercial, commercial backed mortgage securities, where dozens and dozens and dozens of commercial loans uh, against everything from retail to office buildings are all the left side of the balance sheet. And then we look at different strips of securities on the right side of the balance sheet. So what you're making a bet on when you buy the index, CMBX, is you're betting that those loans will have enough integrity to pay off the various layers on the right side of the balance sheet. And as Mike commented, and I, I had sort of I guess I internalized that principle, Mike, that real estate debt is not investment grade. So if you look at what's happened in commercial mortgages versus housing, you'll see that in both housing and commercial, from peak to trough prior to the global financial crisis, housing dropped about 35%, while commercial also dropped around the same amount in terms of valuations. But housing, uh, regained 110% of that loss, while in the case of commercial, um, it, it went beyond that. Not only was the 35% regained, but also another 20-something percent. Could we look at uh, page four, please, next? Um, uh, slide four. So um, what's happened as a, as a result is, and, and you can see, by the way, a lot of these, a lot of these mortgages are also against assets that are fundamentally weaker assets, because one of the components is, is, is retail. And we know what's happened to retail. So mortgages in the commercial, that are in these CMBS packages, and CMBS as, as a source of lending tends to be kind of a lender of last resort. So it sorts out for some of the worst loans. So, so you've had a couple of things happen in the last few years. First, you've had structural degradation in these CMBX structures. So if you're buying triple B investment grade debt, 
which as Mike says, real estate debt is not really investment grade. The, where it sits in the capital structure has moved down. In the most recent issues that are, that are indices of these commercial mortgage uh, loans, you'll see that the triple B layer resides between 6.9 and 10.9. In other words, if there's a 7% drop in the collateral value or in the value of these, of these loans, you start to lose money. And if it goes down 11%, you lose all your money. In the old days, it had to start at 7.6 and go up to 13.8 for you to lose your money. And that was just in 2014. So what's happened is underwriting standards have weakened just as they have in corporate loans. If we go to the next slide, um, it's a slide uh, five, you'll see more evidence of that uh, deterioration. Um, IO loans are interest-only loans. These are borrowers who borrow uh, in a way that they're only paying interest and not amortizing any principal. As you would imagine, the borrowers who use IO loans are among the weakest borrowers in the real estate community. 35% of the underlying loans that underline these CMBX securities uh, were IOs back in 2012. Today, it's 76%. These people, a lot of them will have difficulty refinancing their debt. And the percentage of loans that have subordinated debt below them, in other words, these are capital structures that not only have a first mortgage but have a second, has gone from 11% to 20%. And then if you look down at the bottom statistics, you'll see that Moody's does a stress test on the mortgages that underlie these CMBX securities. And they say that 41% of the securities versus 31% in the past have a loan to value in excess of 120% using their particular stress test. And the final statistic, if you look on the next page, is you'll see that there's already significant underperformance in the actual net operating income of the properties that, un that have these mortgages, to the point where if you look in the 2017 series, which is CMBX 11, they're 7.6% behind projected results already, and they're only a year old. So there's significant credit degradation. So for us, this is a chance to actually short bonds, one of the great liberating things about managing money that doesn't always have to be long is sometimes you can protect yourself with a short that doesn't cost you much. And the CMBX triple B minus securities trade very, very tight. They trade at dollar prices of 95 and above, and they have spreads to uh, LIBOR of maybe 300 basis points. So they cost you very, very little uh, to short. And then in times of stress, like we saw in December, those, those things can drop easily 20 or 25 points, not basis points, but points. So they can go from a price of 95 to say 80 or 75. So they can be very volatile. You have the potential for them to go much, much lower than that if there is actually a number of defaults. And yet they trade right up there with the tightest of securities. So I think sometimes the game is to go long and to go through all the difficulties that at least four of us go through to try to create creative long securities in a market where the, what they're feeding you isn't good. But other times the better approach is to say, hey, the market's really rich, maybe I should go short something as well. And we think that the commercial mortgage-backed market offers us that opportunity at very low price with very positive potential returns um, right now. So I just want to go back to something. Jim brought, he talked about demographics and sense of the amount of issuance and investment. We should also focus on demographics and that in most of the countries in the world, the birth rates have dropped considerably and are substantially below replacement. So if we looked at the country that has led in this area, Japan, at this time, Japan has 8 million empty houses, 8 million. If you want to put that on a per capita basis with the United States, it would be as if you had 20 million empty residential units. And I think you can recognize that the value of those uh, homes has dropped considerably in this environment. With most of the countries, of the 10 most populous countries in the world, there's only two left that have a birth rate uh, above replacement, that being Pakistan and Nigeria. And the U.S. birth rate since 1950 has fallen by 70 percent, and the least number of children. So as we think about demographics in another sense, not necessarily supply and demand, uh, how this might affect. Michael, let's go to yourself. You love complicated situations. You know, when I sit and talk to you, you know, we could talk about the most esoteric things for days. Right. Let's step in and talk a little bit about LBOs again and 
what you see is, are we going to have the same performance in CLOs uh, as we did in the past, or is it going to be different in your opinion? Well, I mean, I, I, there, there's no question that the, uh, the, 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 the underwriting standards have gone down. But again, the reality is the, the structure in those CLOs will actually behave and give you some protection. Clearly, the, this, the overall stress will not be uh, anybody as happy. Will you, will you have a default going into, potentially into the, uh, once you get into the Bs? You, you, you could well. But I mean, my view is that the CLO market is still robust. I do not believe it, it actually changes the probability default, the fact we've got cov uh, covenant light situations. But I very much have the view that we, we will have a, uh, uh, a, a different recovery at, by the time we're finished. And frankly, in some ways, uh, it, it, it worries me much less that we, we are in a, uh, in a cover light world. I mean, look, at the end of the day, one of the things I've done in my time, I used to trade equities. I ran UK domestic equities at, at Goldman Sachs. I mean, let me tell you, they're all securities. You do the fundamental work, and provided you do the fundamental work and structure your portfolio correctly, it'll, it'll, it'll work. Uh, can I have a crystal ball and say the CLOs be, will behave well? I can tell you they'll behave well in the next uh, three to five years. Whether they're going to behave well in the next 10 years, we'll see. Uh, but again, I, I feel uh, pretty, uh, pretty, pretty, uh, pretty constructive about that, uh, that market. So Michael, I just like, when we look at European movement here, we've had a number of years where the banks could have liquefied themselves more. Yeah. And as we look at the US, where less than 20% of these loans today are on the balance sheets of banks, Still, the majority of the European market, the loans are on the balance sheets of banks in Europe versus the United States. Why has Europe not moved faster to deleverage their banks and move more of the loans into investors with the demand from investors to date? And, you know, it's barely moved relative. So if we looked at this chart here, you can see in the U.S., uh, you know, banks own less than 20%, but still the vast majority in Europe is a bank market. What do you attribute well, well, that well, to? Well, again, the, 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 there's no question that the, the, the use its market, the, the, the primary market uh, where investors will be, will be involved in, cannot buy, cannot buy loans. I mean, they can, you, can tra you can get there through a swap, but you really, they really can't buy loans. So that, frankly, means that there is a nat that part of the natural uh, buyers are, are not there. I mean, there's, a, there's an interesting slide, uh, 40, 40. And you can see that the, the, those loans, interesting enough on slide 40, you'll see that those loans uh, are much less volatile than they are in the US. Good news, bad news, I'm, I'm not so sure. But the reason is because, again, they don't live in ETFs, they don't live in USITs, they don't live uh, with retail, and they, they, they're, they're just out there. Now, the reality is one can trade between the two, but I think there is a structural issue there. And in addition, the various, uh, if you like, central banks, regulators, have not forced the Basel III, Basel IV initiatives through the, through the system. And they're now doing it. And what I was talking about earlier, there's actually now an opportunity, something that everyone was talking about. I mean, it, it's, it's there. But uh, I think there is, as always, regrettably, regulation does matter. But, and then provided you understand it, it, it is a, it's a value. Yeah, if I, if I could just jump in, Mike. I mean, I think that slide on the holdings of the loans, I mean, let's be very clear. The European regulators are making a mistake. Uh, the U.S. banking system today is the healthiest it's been in decades, and the healthy securitization market of the CLO market in the U.S. has really forced the risk ownership away from the bank balance sheets onto institutional investors. Uh, appropriately so, and it can get priced every day. In Europe, they're going the opposite direction, yeah. uh, and it's a big mistake, and, and I think that the, the risk retention rules that some, some have gotten changed, but certainly for, for those of us who can, who can, can maneuver, um, you know, the, the European banks, European insurance companies have gotten in good shape, good healthy shape. The European banks, while they have a lot of capital, uh, they, they've not really dealt with some of the issues on their balance sheet. But they have got stuck. That's they right. Have, that's, that's right. And I'd, I'd also add that tying a couple things together, Mike, um, you know, Josh's articulate view of the CMBX market um, concur with, and certainly pre-crisis, and even today, many insurers in the U.S. have large 
CMBS portfolio holdings. Not quite as big as they had in the past, but certainly uh, consequential. At Apollo, we created an insurance company called Athene. Now it's $110 billion in capital and in, in, in assets. Um, it's, it's been able to really carve a different path uh, with an investment-grade portfolio. We, we own no CMBS, but we're a very large on-balance sheet lender of commercial real estate debt where we can originate ourselves, back to Ilfren's comment, uh, structure our own covenants, own the whole tranche, really drive the economics. And that's just another way that, that really managers on the credit side that have the ability to, to navigate that will provide better returns in due course. Yeah, I agree with that, Jim. We have a substantial direct lending business right now, particularly in construction-related financing, because banks simply won't do it. Yep. You, you can't, unless you offer a guarantee, and a lot of developers have been sitting on properties for five years or 10 years, and they finally get entitled to build whatever it is they're trying to build, and it's a very straightforward process with a, with a guaranteed price contract, and getting above 20 or 30 percent loan to value from a bank is almost impossible. And if you're willing to go, say, 65 percent loan to value, the, the returns are, are, are really not commensurate at all with the risk. It's a, it's a, it's a very uh, deep due diligence, local, grinded out business originating these things, but it's a total contrast from what you see going on in the CMBS market. Well, the, the arbitrage you can create in your own origination, that space, if, if you pull up slide 27, is, is staggering, and it really goes to the risk reward of originating yourself versus taking what the market gives you. If you look, and this really picks up Josh's point, if you look at what you can create at a slightly more senior level by originating your own commercial mortgages, and we have a very big commercial mortgage origination platform ourselves at Varde, you see there the expected return in the right-hand column, 12 to 15 percent at a more senior level mm -hmm. than the market for mezzanine uh, is giving you seven to nine percent for, and so you know that really ties together the origination point for C us. Can I add just a, a, a bigger point to this? What does it do to the society? I mean, the reality is one of the reasons why this is so dynamic here in the in, in the U.S. Aside from the fact that central bank is, is adding liquidity, if they mind you, they're adding liquidity around the world. The real problem is that the banks in the in, in Europe are the main source of capital, and they've been they've been, been hamstrung by the by the regulation. And the problem is that wh where do you go? Okay, we, we can do various things as well ourselves, which we, which we do. But the, the reality is that the corporates are still tied to the banks. And lo and behold, you find that Europe is not growing anywhere near as effectively as, uh, as the US. And the, the, the helpful thing in China is that at least uh, they've, they've got a vision and they're happy to keep pumping that sector. So, you know, you've got the Chinese with a, with a command economy doing their bit, you've got the US pushing the things there, and Europe is somewhere stuck in the middle. It's, uh, it, 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 it does actually matter. I think, you know, quite often you know, over the years, I keep pointing out the importance of the 73-77 period in the U.S. when the banks pulled away and difficulties, interest rates doubled, price of oil went up, uh, stock market went down 50 percent, markets were closed, that the corporate uh, manager, the CEO, the CFO, had to go to the public market and didn't want to be subject to this occurring again. And so since the late 70s, the U.S. has really been financed by public and private markets. The people on the stage are originated by David at Credit Suisse, where this is yet to occur in Europe and why it's such a different world if you look at the U.S. today from that standpoint, and why, as Jim pointed out, the banks have never been in better shape, and they play a much different role in the United States, and this is really not transitioned around the world. And so even though the banks shrunk, in many cases, by 50 percent uh, in the 1980s, adjusted for inflation, the U.S. grew because of the financing of public and private markets. David, when I look at Europe today, and I see non-investment grade debt yielding two or two and a half percent less than the U.S. Uh, why isn't there more of a demand for companies to go into the public or private markets, sell debt in euros, figure out how they're going to hedge the euro? If you're sitting in Credit Suisse, why aren't you talking 
to every company in, around the world about borrowing in euros today. Well, uh, and then the penalty for not being rated, if you look at AT&T, I just want to give you an example. It's moved from AAA to BBB. But if you look at AT&T bonds in Europe, you'll find they might be yielding 1% in euro. They might be yielding 2% or 3% depending on maturity. So they have not paid any significant penalty by moving from AAA uh, to triple B, and this is a subject we haven't discussed. But today, uh, as you look at private equity that has more leverage in its capital structure, the marketplace has been willing to buy triple Bs at a very narrow spread versus higher rate securities. And so you're starting to see fundamental changes in corporate structure, and whether it's recently in AT&T or even Verizon or in IBM with its acquisition of Red Hat. David? Yeah, we are, we are doing just that. We are talking about um, what you can get done in the European marketplace and then saying let's sw swap it back into dollars for U.S. nationals and what have you. It has worked. Uh, it hasn't worked as often as we th think it would. Um, the, the U.S. market still is, is, a, is a far more liquid market, is a, a far more... Um, it's a market that um, everyone is trading far more than Europe, so it's not in the in the single B land. The, it's not as easy to get that that type of deal done. If you if you go to page uh, slide 66, and we talk about um, what's going to happen going forward in the U.S. marketplace, you have private equity dry powder. Um, this is the amount of money that private equity has to invest over the next five to seven years. Um, it's 1.3 trillion dollars. Um, that's up over 130% over, that actually is supposed to be on top of 2012. So it's more than doubled since 2012, despite the amount of M&A that's gone on over the past six years. Um, so you have all this money coming into private equity. That, that money needs to be invested over time. If you flip to the next slide, if that money is put to work, and you just use the earlier slide where we said it's about 60% debt, 40% equity, that's three and a quarter billion dollars, three and a quarter trillion dollars of purchasing power that people like Jim's firm has that will be used as a instrument to buy companies over the next five to seven years. So, and then you look at what we're doing, we're gonna be putting two trillion of that out into the market, originating it, distributing it, trading it, which is about 75% of today's marketplace. So if private equity doesn't raise another dollar and it's only private equity, you see our market almost doubling over the next five to seven years in so the US. So in closing here in our last couple of minutes, um, here in the afternoon of April 29th, 2019, I'd like to go through the panel, just quick answers here, as to see first, what do you think the capacity is? And I, I'm sure, David, everyone would love to see two trillion as Jim has pointed that they could buy at six to eight percent if you can offer it with covenants. But uh, what what is the capacity? There are trillions of dollars in liquidity around the world. Seventeen trillion invested at minus in Japan, minus minus returns in Germany today. So I'd like to go through and start with yourself, Elvin. What's your capacity? If you got a call from someone that's got three trillion in assets and they say, okay, we're gonna give you a 1% allocation, can you take it? Could you take 30 billion? What do you think your firm could absorb? Oh, I think over a period of time, yes. I mean, I think over a sensible period of time. I mean, we couldn't put 30 billion to work immediately, but you know, we look at the capacity across all of these different strategies that we're involved in and we can put many billions of dollars to work a year and, and more capital than, than we have. So certainly over a sensible period of time, we'd invest that. Josh? I, th I think at our firm, it depends on the product type. So in the real estate lending business, it is a very labor intensive local, um, you know, uh, block by block effort. And, you know, we, we put about a half a billion dollars to work a year and we could probably double or triple that with a few more people and, and, and that would be relatively comfortable. Beyond that, I don't really know. In the hedge funds uh, part of our business, I think we could take $5 billion tomorrow and I don't think it would really alter what we do for a living at all and, and potentially above that, but you'd have to, you always like to do things in a measured way. 
um, our CLO business grows in a measured way because we try to time the market when we can print the liabilities at very tight spreads and the assets at wider spreads. And so we've contained the growth of that specifically. So we've tried to be maybe a little more um, relatively controlled in our asset growth, but, uh, but I think there's a lot of capacity on the, especially on the multi-strategy places where there's an ability to go. I think bank debt, we have an ability to grow quite substantially too because the market's gotten absolutely enormous and we've been a small, very small player within that market. Sir Michael, uh, what is your capacity? Well, d definitely we, we, can, we can grow uh, significantly. Could we deploy 30 billion overnight? Clearly not, but we could we defo deploy that over the, over the next six to 12 months. If I look at the, 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 the loan markets, the various other markets we're, we're involved in, some of the convertible markets, it's, 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 it's doable. And, they, and those returns are uh, significant single, single digit type returns. Jim? All, a lot of our big peers, they, they, have, they have trillions. We still are at 300 billion. So I, I think the, the, the evolution of what's going on with banks is going to continue. Uh, the, the, the growth for yield is going to continue, and while we're 300 billion today, I think in I think in five years our capacity doubles as a firm. Thank you, David. Um, so Jim told us he's concerned about a mismatch of demand and supply. When are you going to solve this problem? <laughs> by, uh, we we by, talk about it every day. We talk about it every day by uh, uh, by next year's panel, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we want to thank you, and I think you've had a chance to see, uh, if I was to summarize one message, a real effort here to build platforms, new platforms, uh, to take new securities where you can reduce the risk and increase the rate of return. Thank you for joining us today.